afternoon, church. Good afternoon, church. Yeah, I know we should be getting ready to finish this, the service, but we are just starting this, the sermon. Uh, I'm praying for the power of the Holy Spirit so that everything will be done and His name will be glorified. I'm going to start with a story that I read some weeks ago. And this is the story about that happened many years ago in a mental health hospital. So in this hospital, they adopted an unusual test to determine when their patients were, sorry, when their patients were ready to go back into the, to the world, that when their patients were ready to be discharged. So they, they decided to adopt an unusual test. And the test was, they took all, whenever a patient was ready to be discharged, they took them to a room. Inside that room, there is a tap running and a sink. So they open the tap and water is running. So when the patient comes in, they'll give the patient a mop and they tell them to start to mop the water that is overflowing. That sounds strange with the tap still running. So the test was, whenever the patient, whoever gets there and starts to mop, that shows the patient is not fit for discharge. But whoever gets there and was able to think to turn off the tap, that shows the person is fit for discharge. So that was the test that was done for them. As Christians in this world today, we are confronted with the battle battle with evil, the battle that evil dominates in this world. But like the patients in the mental health hospital, until we realize where the source of the evil is, we will not really make any contribution towards our defeat. So to conquer the devil, we must conquer the evil that is pouring out from our own heart, and this happens when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, when we undergo true conversion. And to deal with the devil around us, we need a mop, just like those patients in the mental health hospital. And that mop is the spiritual armor that God has provided us. Thank you so much, Shante, for bringing out this message in a song. For those who know this song, I just want you to join me as I prayerfully sing the first stanza, that's my prayer. Not high, but Christ, be honored, love exalted. Not high, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not high, but Christ, in every look and action. Not high, but Christ in every thought and word. Amen. Sorry, let me just check this. All right. So the title for this sermon is Fully Harmed But Powerless. Fully Harmed But Powerless. Uh, let me just say that I'm not a preacher, I'm a teacher, I'm a lecturer, so I'm going to present it as a lecturer, permission. <laughs> so, this morning, I want us to examine a Bible text that we are familiar with, and that we can find in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to verse 18. That's what we are looking at this morning, and we're going to see... I'm so sorry. Sorry, this is not... Sorry about that. I'm just trying to get used to this. Okay. So, I think I should. All right. So, thank you also, Leon, for the Bible reading. So, the focus, the text for focus this morning is actually verse 18. And I'm going to read that again. It reads, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, 
being watchful to this end without perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become children of God. Is that correct? As we experience blessings as children of God, unfortunately, we, just, we also inherit the enemies of God or the enemy of God. And who is that enemy? Satan. So as we're experiencing the blessing of God, we also have to deal with the enemy of God, which is Satan. And what is the purpose of Satan? According to John 8, 44, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But we thank God for Jesus, who has come to destroy the works of Satan. Though Satan is a fallen angel, who might be superior to us in intellect and strength, but is inferior to God in every way. So as children of God, we have the power of the indwelling resurrected Christ to protect us from the dangers of Satan as well as his, ange his angels. Do you know any spiritually dangerous Christian? Do you know anyone? A spiritually dangerous Christian. That is a Christian that prays. Some of us, we have never pulled the trigger of prayer. And we are likely to even pull it now. So when the devil encounters us, he's not afraid of us. Yes, he's not afraid of us because we don't really pose any threat to him. Because we are fully harmed, but we are powerless. Because we are prayerless. I want us to quickly examine the ways by which Satan attacks us. And one thing Satan does is that he looks for ways to create gap in our relationship with God. He creates breaches in our relationship with God. And I try to look at how, you know, I try to categorize some of these breaches here. The breaches could be in form of unconfessed sins. And some of the unconfessed sins in our lives could be, one, idols. Idols, these are things that we make to be more important in our lives than God. And yes, we can say, yeah, some of us can make material wealth our idols. We can make our, our job our idols. We can make how we look our idols. But the most difficult of those idols are actually ourselves, us. Self-idolatry is the worst sin because we place ourselves above God. And what comes to our mind when I said that? Who actually did that? Who, who was the first person that did this? Who? Satan. That was the origin of sin. He tried to place himself above God. Then another, another type of unconfessed sin is on addictions. We might be addicted to a physical substance like food, video games, novels, pornography, uncontrolled thoughts, uh, any, anything. Again, addiction could be something that is good, but that has taken, we, we could be addicted to something good, but that has taken over the focus of our lives. For example, trying to be the boss at work, making lots of money. There's nothing wrong in all of this, but when they take precedence over our relationship with God, then they become addiction. Addictions are always something that we cannot imagine giving them up. But if God is to remain the king of our lives, he must be the Lord of our lives. He must be our addiction. Nothing else should come between us and our God. Then we have ungodly conversations. And this is prevalent among Christians. Simply because this kind of sin, ungodly mindset, they are kind of respected among Christians because they are sins of the mind. And they often go unrebuked because everyone seems to be struggling with a kind of ungodly mindset. So how can you preach against something that everyone is guilty of? The most popular and godly mindsets are pride, maybe pride in our achievements, 
pride in the talent that God has given us, pride in feeling of superiority over others. It could be arrogance, self-righteousness, uh, selfishness, greed, refusing to forgive people, lack of thankfulness, fear, hate, self-pity, and so on. Even disrespect to the authority. We have ungodly conversations. That's another type of unconfessed sin. And this is again common among Christians. For example, gossip. And in Christendom, people call it only gossip. Criticism, backbiting, murmuring, insensitive judgments, expressing doubt toward God, doubt toward the church, towards the ministry in church. And then we have ungodly behaviors. These are behaviors that are normal and accepted or acceptable in the world that we live in, but not to God. And some examples are manipulation, taking advantage of others, cheating, laziness at work, immodest dressing, flaunting our bodies to attract attention to ourselves rather than to God, and even breaking the commandments of God. Then we have ungodly relationships. It could be a form of codependent relationship where people have um, a kind of unhealthy dependence on relationship at their own cost, or they have an exaggerated sense of responsibility for the action of other people. It could be a form of inappropriate relationships with the opposite sex, or even unbiblical sexual relationships in all its forms. It could be a form of uh, relationship outside marriage. All of these are unconfessed sins. Then we also have worldly preoccupations, which could be a form of love for money, shopping, material uh, possessions, uh, love for electronic gadgets, worldly music, um, movies, and all those. Once these things take our attention away from God. And then we have satanic strongholds. That's another way Satan attacks us in these days. There are people that are involved in mind-altering drugs. They, they use that all the time, or tobacco, or alcohol, or fortune-telling, hypnosis, spiritualism, witchcraft, and mysticism. Again, that reminds me of a story a true, this, this, again, this happened some, some time ago where an Adventist missionary was traveling and his flight was delayed. So he tried to initiate a conversation with the person that sat next to him and he introduced himself to this person and said, oh, hello, I'm this, this, I'm a missionary, I'm going for a missionary work. And this actually happened in South America. So the missionary was going to one of the villages to minister there. So the person that sat next to him also introduced himself and said, oh, I'm this, this. And he asked, so what do you do? And the person said, I am a witch doctor. And he said, what do you mean? What do you do as a witch doctor? He said, actually, I cast spell on people. For example, I can cast spell on your wife and she will stop loving you. I can cast spell on you and you can fall sick. And then I can cast spell on you and you become well. And the, the missionary said, no way. You can't do that to me. He said, I can. The missionary insisted, no, you can't. He said, okay, let me ask you some questions. So he asked the missionary. He said, do you watch pornography? The missionary said, no. Do you watch magic movies? He said, no. Do you watch occultic movies? He said, no. So popular, no. Worldly magazines, and he mentioned some of the magazines around where they, the area where they were. And the, the, the missionary said, no. Do you listen to rock and roll music and other types of music? The man said, no. And then the, fortune, the, 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 the uh, witch doctor now said, you are right. I cannot touch you and your family. But the moment you take part in any of these activities, I can exercise all the power in the world on you. The lesson behind this story is, wherever we live, we should know that the presence of the devil is real. The devil's power is real. 
When God threw Satan out of heaven, it did not take his power from him. He still has his power, and he has his angels as well. All that he needs is a little foothold of sin to sneak, to sneak into our lives and wreck havoc in our lives. His methodology is just to break the relationship we have with God. So we need to remember that we cannot stand against the attacks of the enemy alone. We need a power that is greater than us. And the last one is sins of omission. Oftentimes, we fail to recognize what we are not doing right. We engage in the sins of omission in the attitudes and lifestyles which God has called us to do. Anything that involves lack of whatever God has told us to do. It could be in form of lack of Bible study, interest in Bible study, lack of interest in prayer, lack of friendliness, lack of fruit of the Spirit, lack of kindness, like, 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 lack of complete heart surrender to God. I'm sure by now we'll, some of us will start to think, I, we have actually mentioned some of the things I'm dealing with. Don't feel discouraged. There is hope. God always speaks hope and courage. Just the fact that we have realized our weakness, it doesn't mean we have to be there. If we are falling in any of these areas, including myself, do not lose heart. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And uh, this also tells us the need for self-evaluation. Sadly, this is not what many of us are interested in doing. We try to shy away from self-evaluation. But as Christians, we really need to do that through the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to know those weak areas in our lives. And when we are, when we are able to identify this, it, it will bring us to a state where we desperately need the Savior. And I'm going to actually read something from the pen of inspiration that says, it is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that God can save. We must know our real condition or we shall not feel our need for Christ's help. If we don't understand our danger, we won't flee to the refuge. If we don't feel the pain of our wounds, we don't desire healing. And that is from Ellen G. White's Christ's Object Lesson, page 158. So looking at all of this, I'm sure inside, within us we'll be thinking, yes, some of this actually affects me, or one of these actually affects me. If any of this affects us, or if we feel, feel that, yeah, nothing, I'm not doing any of this. But don't forget that you are living in a sinful world. And Paul admonished us in Ephesians that we need to be aware of the, the times that we are in and that we are not fighting physical battle. For example, you cannot use physical weapon to fight spiritual battles. He said we are fighting against powers and principalities. So if when we are fighting with powers and principalities, we also need a power that is greater than those principalities to fight that. And that is why he introduced us to the armor of God. The whole armor of God. And that is what I want us to look at briefly before I wrap up. Just like I said, every one of us is involved in a warfare. I'm sure we are all familiar with this phrase, harmed and dangerous. Have we all come across that before? Armed and dangerous. This is often used, in, 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 uh, it's used among the law enforcement. When a criminal is on the run with a weapon, you hear something like, oh, be careful, protect yourself, the criminal has a weapon and will use it. In other words, what they are saying is that person has pulled the trigger before and is likely to pull it again. So you need to be very careful. That is how Satan operates. He has pulled the trigger many times against us as God's children. And he will likely do it again and he will continue to do it again until Christ comes. And this is why we cannot survive without the full armor of God. In Ephesians 6, verse 6, Paul writes, 
I'm going to read that. Ephesians 6 is, it says that we need the old armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. So it is important for us to understand what these armors, what these, the pieces of the armor, what they are, and the implications in our war, in, our, in, our, in the spiritual world that we are in. I'm going to pick each one of them and then we'll talk about them briefly. So the first one is, let me, so yeah, so the old armor of God, there are six of them. We have the waist guarded with truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. So let's examine them briefly. In verse 14 of Ephesians 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Can someone please read that? Ephesians 6, 14. Sorry, can we get a microphone? Ephesians 6, 14. Hold on, please. Yeah, our online worshippers will not hear without the microphone. Thank you. Stand therefore, having your lions girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, thank you. So we have the waist, that's the first one. Waist guarded with truth. The waist or abdomen was generally thought to be the seat of emotions. And to get, get this area is to commit our emotions or believe the truth. Often, we knowingly allow ourselves to believe a lie because of fear or self-pity. As believers, we must hold a commitment to truth regardless of the repercussions. Without the belt, the truth of God, our spiritual movements are ampered and we have no restraints. So the, the waste, our waste needs to be guarded with truth. And the second one that was also read, that's the second part of the same verse, is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Well, many, many of us are Christi as Christians, we are exposed in this spiritual war because we are fighting without the covering of the breastplate. That is the righteousness of God. Our heart needs to be kept pure and righteous because sin gives a foothold to the enemy. Then the next one, right, the next one is fit shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 15, we can find that there. Proper shoes, you know, I'm sure we're all wearing shoes. When we wear proper shoes, we're able to move around. As a soldier, a Christian soldier, we are not expected to walk barefooted. We need to, because God has given us an assignment, a responsibility in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And what is that? To go out and preach the gospel of peace. And we cannot preach barefooted. We need the direction of God. We need to go the right way that God wants us to go. Christians in this spiritual work cannot afford to be found barefooted on the field. We must be prepared and resolved as to the gospel of Christ. And then the next one is verse 16, the shield of faith. So with the shield of faith, we need to know that our accuser, Satan, is ready to fire us, is ready to attack us, just like we can see in that picture. But faith acts as an invisible shield that deflects the attacks of the devil. We should not enter the spiritual world without the shield of faith. Our faith must be active in the spiritual world. Because the devil is ready to plant doubts in our lives. And then we have the helmet of salvation, which is the next one. 
We can find that in Ephesians 6, 17, the first part. A helmet protects the head, that's the brain, and thoughts. So, as we enter spiritual warfare, we must secure our heads, our minds, with the helmet of salvation. We have this hope, and this hope is in Jesus Christ. What do we say? Amen. Amen. So it's important for us to secure our heads and our minds in this spiritual warfare. And the last one there is the sword of the Spirit. And that is the Word of God. This we can find again in verse 17, second part. So many of us as Christians, we are trying to engage the enemies, the enemy with the hope of winning the war without studying God's word. Of course, this will never happen. If you remember the, the ex example of Jesus, when Jesus was faced with Satan, what did he use to attack Satan? What did he use? The word of God. So if Christ is our example, we cannot do without the word of God. We need to study the word of God. We, need just, we just don't need to have the head knowledge, but we should actually put it in practice. When we read it, we put it in practice. We need to commit it to memory so that when we are attacked by the devil, the word of God says the spirit will bring the word to our remembrance. Even though we, would, we, we, we might have commit to memory a lot of Bible texts, but when we are faced with that attack, the spirit will, will prompt us, this is the right one to use. If we remember during COVID, when people were afraid, what, can you remember one of the common Bible texts that people kept, they were sending at every point? Psalm 91. And another one is First Chronicles. If my people who bear my name shall help themselves and pray, I, it's the Holy Spirit that bring, or bring all these Bible texts to our, our memory when we need for us, it is important for us to commit the word of God into memory. Now, we have looked at all this, but I, while I was looking at this Bible text, there were some things that I noticed were very unique about this uh, armor of God. And that's what I want us to look at briefly. The last one is prayer. We are still going to talk more on this. Actually, this is what the sermon dwells on. Our uh, Everything, all the armor, the pieces of armor, the Bible says we have to do everything. So while wearing the belt, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of a faith, everything has to be done in prayer. Because prayer opens the channel between us and God. So during the battle, you can imagine when... Uh, when the soldier is in battle, they often have their commander, and that's the one that gives order, and that's the person they listen to. So in our own spiritual battle, we have Christ as our commander. So even as we are wearing all the armor, as we are putting everything on, we need to open our ears so that we listen to the commander as the commander gives orders, as the, order, as the commander directs us, as the commander encourages us. It's important for us to pay attention and not to be discouraged. Now let's look at those things that are unique about this armor. The first thing that I noticed was that each armor has a specific purpose. And there is a logical sequence of wearing the armor. For example... The first one is the belt, followed by the breastplate, and then the proper shoes, and then the shield, and the helmet, and then the sword of the spirit. The next thing is each piece of armor. You can imagine a soldier. If a soldier, a soldier is expected to actually have all these pieces of uh, armor, but if they are not one, are they useful? Please answer. Are they useful? So, we are not just to have them and keep them. We are meant to wear them on a daily basis because we are fighting a war. And then, if you also notice, there is no armor for the back. Did you notice that? Everything is just the front. There is nothing for the back. 
And when I was reading that, what came to my mind is, when we are in a battle, when a soldier is in battle, do you back your enemies? Please answer. Do you back your enemies? No. You face the enemy. And this is what God expects us to do. We should never enter the warfare and turn our back on the enemy. We can't turn and run. If we do, we leave ourselves exposed. So we must arm ourselves, stand, face the enemy, and fight in the power of God and in his might. And the fourth thing is that all these pieces of armor, they are all defensive weapons. That is, they are used for the safety and protection of the soldier. And the only one that is an offensive weapon is what? The word of God. The sword is the only offensive weapon. It's both offensive and defensive, while the rest are only defensive. And if you remember, when Christ faced Satan, he used the word of God. You can imagine something that is offensive. Of course, it's going to trigger the enemy. It's going to injure the enemy. It's going to, if possible, kill our enemy. It's a way of attacking our enemy. So it's important for us to have both the defensive as well as the offensive weapon. And Paul now said, do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Pray on every occasion as the Spirit leads. Let's remember that prayer is very important. We cannot be fully harmed and not be powerful. We need to be powerful. We can't be powerless. And we can only be powerful when we engage in prayer. When we are fully harmed and we refuse to pray, what we are getting is a false sense of security in that war. Because yes, we can actually have everything, but when we are not praying, our defensive systems are weak and our offensive systems are inefficient. So the fact that we are fully harmed does not guarantee any success. We can be fully harmed and we lose physically and spiritually because we are not praying. Too many Christians are trusting in the harmor, not in the provider of the harmor. Can we resonate with that? Do we trust in the armor or the provider of the armor? Don't put on the armor and become overly confident in the hammer and forget that we must be reliant on God. He said, do all this in prayer, asking for God's help. Furthermore, we are instructed to pray on every occasion. As Christians engage in spiritual warfare, what we often do is we pick and choose if and when we want to pray or when we need to pray. But this Bible text today is telling us that we need to pray as the Spirit leads. We need to rely totally on the Spirit of God. So don't become too confident in the armor and neglect to follow God's leading. Any soldier can dress up for war and go onto the battlefield fully protected. It's more likely to defect. However, if you cannot trust the leading of the commander. A commander, that is God, knows the strategy for victory. Thus, as soldiers, we are expected to follow his leading, despite being fully armed. So finally, Paul instructs us, pray always for all God's people. So it is not just for us to pray as a soldier, we also need to pray for fellow soldiers and that we have as intercessory prayer. It's very important because we are in, in the end time. What has ever may change, prayer and intercessory prayer must not change. It, they must continue and they must be constant in our lives as God's children. Intercessory prayer is an important aspect of spiritual warfare. We are also to admonish that 
and ensure that all our brothers and sisters are fully harmed and that we are praying for them. So it's not just about me praying or about you praying. I need to ensure, and my brothers praying, and my sisters also praying. It is very important. And one author actually wrote this, Jeff Callum. Do I have that? Okay, that's the end. So he says, when we check our duty in God's army to pray and seek him daily, what invariably happens is that we drop our guard and get suddenly and unexpectedly blindsided by spiritual ambush. Let me read that again. When we shirk our duty in God's army to pray and seek him daily, what invariably happens is that we drop our guard and get suddenly and unexpectedly blindsided and by spiritual ambush. So this afternoon, the question I have for every one of us is, are you a real warrior? As a soldier of Christ, marching as to war. Remember that our song. Are you a warrior? Unfortunately, putting on the full armor is where most of us stop. And wrongfully so. Most of us can quote Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. But we've never taken the time to read, memorize, or even apply verse 18 while at war. The first thing it says is, do all this. All what? Put on the belt, the breastplate, the boots, the shield, the helmet, and sword in prayer. Prayer is a weapon that most of us do not use. Like this church, every Wednesday we have prayer meetings. How many of us show up online? There have been calls for prayer. How many of us show up? It's important for us not only to pray individually, but we also need to come together and make sure that we are praying as a family of God because we are facing a real enemy that means no business. He's ready to attack us. So I'm admonishing every one of us this morning. If you think you are a warrior, I'm encouraging you to rise Put your armor on. And what are you supposed to put on? The belt. Put on your belt, the truth of God. Your breastplate of righteousness. Your shoes, which is the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. The helmet of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And buckle them on. It in prayer. Buckle them on with prayer. Brothers and sisters, again, I'm encouraging us. Don't get caught fully harmed, but powerless, because you are prayerless. 